start with our kids. So any of our kids that want to come up, I, I, I want to talk to you over this morning about something I need to know about. So I need your advice. So, so all, all our kids that, that, that want to come up, come on up, that way you can give me advice, okay? All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, I need some help today. Okay, and, and we got a bunch of guys and we got one gal. So, so I, I'm going to need help from all of you. I need to be handsome. Okay, so I know it's going to be a hard job. Don't have to look at me like that. But, but, but what, the, what makes a guy handsome? Can anybody tell me? Anybody got any ideas? What, what, what do you think? A tuxedo, that would be a good idea, okay? A tuxedo, maybe if I had a tuxedo, I'd be handsome. What else do you think? Nice. Do what? Nice. Being nice, okay. He'd be, make it being nice and be handsome, that's a good idea. What else, what else do you think? A haircut. A haircut, a haircut could make me, you, you think I could get a little more cake at all? <laughs> Uh, we can try that though. It's starting to get a little bushy on the side, so haircut. That would help. What else do you think? Well, what makes a guy handsome? Any other ideas? What do you think? Smell good. The smell good. <laughs> All right, so I, I like that idea. He's got the, if he doesn't smell good, is some girl going to think he's handsome? No. no. Okay, now let, let's change it a little bit. What about the girls? What makes a girl pretty? A dress. A dress. If she did a dress, that makes her look pretty. Okay, I like that. What else do you think? What else do you think? Hey, this is getting real boring. What makes a girl pretty? What, what, do you, what are some of the things you, you think of? What, what do you think of when, when mom does this? She, she looks really pretty. Lipstick. Lipstick. Okay, that's a good one. Makeup. Okay. That works. So, so, so maybe a, a girl will make up or lipstick or, or something like that. Any other ideas? We got a dress and lipstick and makeup. And for the guy, he needs. Ooh, there we go. And for the guy, he needs a tux and he needs to have his hair cut and and he needs to smell good and be nice. Okay, so that that's our things. Why is it important for us to think about what we look like? How, how many of you guys are married? <laughs> any of you married? Does anybody have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Oh, you got a girlfriend. Oh, so so we we got to be nice to you. Um, but you think one day you might have a boyfriend or girlfriend, and you want them to look at you and go, "Ooh, he's handsome, or she is pretty." You, you want that? You want them to be attracted to you, don't you? And one of the things we have to learn is, is what makes us attractive. You know, sometimes the attractive isn't what's on the outside. I could put on my tuxedo. I could put on my deodorant. Mm -hmm. I, 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 could, I could do all kinds of I could even cut my hair. But if I'm not nice, am I really handsome? Because sometimes what makes us attractive is what's on the inside. And, and just, you know, the person that we really are. A girl might be beautiful, or a guy might be handsome, he might have muscles, and, and, and if he's mean, that's not attractive, is it? So you guys have helped me today. So I'm going to take your advice, and I'm going to work on being handsome, okay? And you guys can do the same thing, and, and you're already pretty, so. All right, thank you, guys. Let's give them a hand as they go back to their seats.
Well, congratulations to you as well. Now, raise your hand if you would like to be in a dating relationship. <laughs> So, now, here's the thing. Raise your hand if you have figured out that the opposite sex is completely different from you. Absolutely, they are different, aren't they? I once worked with a guy who claimed to have women all figured out. We were in a conversation talking about women one time, and he said, I've got women all figured out. I just stayed away from him the rest of the time. I don't like to be around a liar. <laughs> but, but what is it about the opposite sex are so different from us? And we say, well, I have no idea. I can't figure them out. But I think one of the greatest desires of mankind is to understand the opposite sex. And, and understanding them sometimes can be very difficult, can it? Did you realize that understanding the opposite sex or, or ways to understand is the most researched item on the internet? I, I, I just for the fun of it, what makes my and just see what comes up? Because most of the time you're going to find what makes my wife do this or what makes my husband do that or, or something. It's one of the most researched items. You go into any bookstore, what's one of the largest sections in the bookstore? Self-help. What's the largest section of self-help? Dating, marriage, all those things about trying to understand the opposite sex. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take five weeks, and we're going to look at understanding the opposite sex. We're going to do it from the Bible. Now, to make this really fun, we're going to look at the Song of Solomon. <clears throat> so get your Bibles and turn there. The best way, start at the middle. That's Psalms. Go toward the back. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Now, I, I've done heard a uh and a woo uh, and, and I said we're going from the Song of Solomon. Because the Song of Solomon can be a really fun book. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of good stuff in the book of Song of Solomon. There's also a lot of serious intimacies in the Song of Solomon. So parents, don't worry. We're going to keep it PG rated. And that means you might get some questions. And if you do, answer them honestly. But remember, only answer the question they ask. Sometimes they don't need everything you know about the subject. <laughs> But, but, but we, we want to do that, so, so we're, we're going to keep it kind of low-key, but we want to look, it's February, it's Valentine's month, right? So everybody's now thinking, you go to the store, what do you first thing you see? You see the hearts and the flowers and the candies and, and all the things that represent Valentine's Day, so you're thinking about love. So we're going to take this month, and we're going to look at five areas that, that I think are necessary from Scripture. To understand, or, or to, let's do it this way, to better understand the opposite sex. But I will tell you, when you read through the book of Song of Solomon, some of your titles may say Song of Songs, that's okay. That, that's accurate as well. But, but when you look through it, you're going to find some pretty serious stuff there. And, and let me tell you how serious it was. The, the book of Song of Solomon is so serious that Hebrew boys were not permitted to read it. They would keep the Song of Solomon away from the Hebrew women because they were afraid that they might get excited if they were reading it. So, so you can tell, there's some pretty good stuff in there. One time I was teaching the youth in Bible school, and we were talking about it, somebody said something about the Song of Solomon, and somebody said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's the X-rated book of the Bible. The next day, a mother comes to me and says, I don't know what you told my son in Bible school last night, but he read his Bible for over an hour when he got home last night. <laughs> I never told her. She was so proud of him, I never told her any different. But, but here's the thing. Because of what's written there, it's one of those books that a lot of churches won't touch. A lot of places won't look at. Most pastors won't preach from the Song of Solomon. Matter of fact, you ought to try to find a children's bulletin from the book of Song of Solomon. 
I will warn you with our, I found one, that's what they got today. They're going to get, they may get Moses or something the rest of the month. Because there is nothing else from the Song of Solomon. But, but those folks avoid it. But folks, look around us. Look at the struggling relationships that we're aware of. Look at those either married or engaged or dating relationships that, that are hurting right now. Do you realize the divorce rate is higher than those who stay married? In today's culture, a person who has been married five years is considered extreme. We need to look at the book of Song of Solomon. We need to understand better the opposite sex. So we want to see what does the Bible teach us about women? What does the Bible teach us about men? Now, there's something else you need to know about the book of Song of Solomon before we dive in there. The book of Song of Solomon is classified as wisdom literature. Now, here's what that means. It's written in a poetry, a Hebrew poetry form. And that means you understand it totally different than you do on most of the rest of the Bible. And I'll give you some examples. If you were studying the book of Romans, and you come to Romans chapter 3, and it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? That means we're all sinners, and no matter how much we try to make ourselves right, we all fall short of that mark of perfection. That's, I mean, it's exactly what it says. But when you're looking at Hebrew poetry, when you're looking at wisdom literature in the Bible, you don't quite interpret it just as it says. Let me give you an example there. And when, when we get there, the book of Psalms, of Psalms chapter 4, here's what verses one, 1 and 2 says. Now, the writer is describing his lover. And here's the description he has of his lover in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. He says, look at you. You are beautiful, my true love. Look at you. You are so beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are like doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats moving down Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of, of sheep about to be sheared, sheep coming from the wash. Guys, I dare you. <laughs> I dare you to go home and look your sweetie in the eye and say, hey, baby, <laughs> your eyes look like doves. Your hair looks like a goat. <laughs> and your teeth look like sheep. I dare you to try it. And I know some of you will. <laughs> my burying coat is in my office. I'm ready if you try that. But, but here, look, you look at it and you go, okay, I have no idea what he's saying. Because we don't look at it as, as this is what it literally means. It, it, it's wisdom literature. It's poetry. So, so what we're doing is we're looking at it metaphorically. He says, your eyes are beautiful. Your hair is long and flowing. Your teeth are perfect and white. He, he, he's being romantic to her. But just don't try it the way he did it. <laughs> so so that, that kind of gives us an idea of how we're going to have to look at the Song of Solomon as we go through. But there is a lot of good stuff there. Now, what we need to do, now that we kind of have an understanding of the book, let's begin to look at some of those areas that in our life we need to, we need to know what the Bible says in order to understand the opposite sex. And to do that, here's where we're going to start. We're going to start with what we're attracted to, or what's attracted to us. So, so for week one, understanding the opposite sex, we're going to look at attraction, because that's where we need to start. What, what, is it, what are we attracted to? What attracts others to us? And I'm going to give you a handful of things that I think from Scripture we see that, that we did. And rather than just read a passage, I want to kind of take it one at a time as we move through it and see what Scripture says. So, so let's just begin. Number one, to, to be attracted, we need to feel attraction. 
For, for us, we need to feel attracted. Let's face it. There are things that attract us to the opposite sex. But there's also things about the opposite sex that we do not find attractive. That there are things that we might, we might say, I, I don't like that in the opposite sex. You know, and, and you, you want to do some research? Just see, look at the lists on the internet of things that, that people do not find attractive in the opposite sex. But, but let's think about it. What are some of the things that, that, that they might not find attractive? I have yet to find a guy who looks at a girl in sweatpants and a baggy t-shirt and says, oh, she is fine. That normally don't happen, does it? I mean, what do our kids say? They put on a dress, a little old makeup, maybe some lipstick, and, and then they go, ooh, baby. But, but, but there are things that we just kind of don't find attractive. And, and it's the same way when guys look at girls. One of the things I'm, I'm finding is girls do not find it attractive when the guy's underwear is six inches above his belt line. <laughs> but you know why they tolerate it? Because it's better than seeing his hiney. And, and, and so you know, there are things that are not attractive. So I, I begin to, to look. And, and I want to do a lot of research. And I want to see what does the Bible or what, what does the internet tell me the folks behind. And there is a ton of stuff out there. But look, at, I found there are some things that, that the guys and the girls, the gals and the guys have in common. So I'm going to give you three that I found a lot in the list. That, that, that the opposite sex does not find attractive in you. Number one, foul language. Often I found on list after list that something guys didn't find attractive in girls, girls didn't find, was foul language. You know what I taught my kids all their life about foul language? The person who uses foul language, if, especially if it's a guy, the reason they do that is they're compensating for something else that's lacking in their life. And folks don't find that attractive. There's nobody that's going to look at you after you use the F bomb and go, oh, I like that. And that's something that the folks don't find. Another one, and, and I thought this was kind of funny, greasy or unkept hair. The kids told me I need to get hair cut. So, so one of the things is, is greasy or unkept hair. Does nobody find that attractive? And the third one that I found on both lists, in, in many of the lists, was Something that people don't find attractive is a person who smokes. Now, I, I know. I know what's going to happen. I know that sometime today, after the service, later today, sometime this week, there's going to be somebody that's going to come up to me, and they're going to say, Pastor Dad, you don't find me attractive because of smoke. <laughs> I know what's going to happen, but, but, you know, that's just what the statistics say. But in verse 2, I want you to see something. So here's what it says in the first part of verse 2. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Now, to, to this first chapter, it's kind of like the girl's talking, and then the guy's talking, and then the girl's talking, and, and you got to figure, but here's what she's saying. I find him attractive. I want him to kiss me. She feels attracted to him. And desires to be kissed by him and to be loved by him more than anything else. For a relationship, there needs to be an attraction. So, so we're going to look at what attracts us to the opposite sex or what, what attracts them to us. Number two, number two, the second thing is we need to be sweet. We need to be sweet. And everybody knows a little bit about what it means to be sweet, because we like it to us, but we struggle doing it to others. Look at the, the second part of verse 2. It says, your expressions of love are better than wine. And here's what she's saying. She's saying to her man, I want you to be sweet. I like it when you're sweet. I like it when you do this little sweet thing. Now, let me, let me just take a break and talk to the guys for a second. Guys, you have the perfect opportunity right now. We are in the season of sweetness. It's Valentine's. 
So, so there are things that you can do for that special gal that is going to be very sweet. And you can start today. But when you leave, I want you to sign up to come to our, our church's Valentine's banquet. So, so go ahead. And then this Friday, come. Bring her. All you got to do is get her there and pay for her meal. I'll provide the entertainment. So, so it, it's a win-win. And she's going to look at you and she's going, he's so sweet. And she's going to plug her ears right now and pretend she didn't hear it from me. It was all your idea. And then when Valentine's Day rolls around, I think that's like next Monday. Get her something. Now, gals, do this for a minute. You really don't need to hear this. So guys, listen to me. She don't know if the card came from the Hallmark, the Walmart, or the Dollar Tree. <laughs> but just get her something. And then give it to her in a nice way. Think of something special. Don't just go to her and go, Peter, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> that won't get you zero points. Even if you bought the expensive card with the, the singing or something. Do, do something unique and give it to her. You know, slip it into her car before she goes to work. You know, set it on the table where you prepare dinner. But give it to her some way sweet. Gals like guys who are sweet. And, and, and our gals are said to her, yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen a couple elbows from being a good Let's go back your dad. But gal, I, I, I'm going to warn you for a second. But let, let, me, let me tell you. You need to watch out for the one who's only sweet. You know, sweet is a wonderful character, characteristic. But there are some guys that sweet is all they had going on. And, and, and that, that sweet, well, you might be attracted to that sweet. But sometimes guys are only sweet to get the gal. They'll do all those sweet things until they get them. Then it don't happen anymore. I've seen guys, they'll come to church and to, to be with the guy until they get the gal. And then you never see them again. Ladies, if, you're, if you have a man who is only sweet, and that's the only thing he has going for him, and that's his only quality, then I'll tell you what will happen. A few years down the road, Maybe a couple babies later, you're going to find him being sweet on somebody else. Sweet is important, but it can't be the only characteristic. Let's see the next characteristic. The third one is we need to have a good reputation. This, this, this lover has said, you know, my, my lover needs to be sweet. But in verse 3, he says, she says this, better than the fragrance of cologne. Cologne should be named after you. No wonder the young women love you. Just like the fragrance of cologne being poured out, just like that fragrance lingers, the name or your reputation of a man lingers as well. You need to have a good reputation. You, you need to have, she says, you know, name the cologne after you. Because he's, not because he smells good or looks good, he's got a good name. A name that she's proud to be associated with. Guys, if every woman you know were to put a label on you, if right now every female you know were to label you, what would that label be? That's your reputation. That's your name. And, and looking at that, what would that be? What what is that going to look like? What would that reputation be that they're going to label you with? Thinking about the opposite sex. There we go. Thinking about the opposite sex. There is a lot of things we need to see, and one of those is we need to have a good name. We need to have a good reputation. 
We said that a man needs to be sweet, and that, that's true. But gals, if you don't have a good reputation as well, that sweet's going to end soon. So, so look at that reputation. Find out the reputation of a man before he becomes your man. Is he consistently a man of God? Is he a Sunday Christian? Or is he only coming to church just to be sweet? There's a huge difference. We need to know the reputation. And we need to have a good reputation. Number four. Number four to be an attraction is we need to be a hard worker. Now, we kind of shift gears here because here it's now what the guy sees in the gal in this section of the, the first chapter. And here's what it says. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Young women of Jerusalem, I am dark and lovely like Kadar's tents, like Solomon's curtains. Stop staring at me because I am so dark. The sun has tanned me. My brothers were angry with me. They made me the caretaker of the vineyards. I have not even taken care of my own vineyards. Now, here's what the woman is saying there. She said, don't look at me. Don't look at me. I have to work. I have to work hard. I have to work outside. I'm in the sun. And because of that, my skin has kind of turned dark, maybe leathery. She said, she compared it to a goat hide that's used to make tents. And she said, because of that, I don't feel attractive. But the man finds the fact that she's a hard worker, attractive. He doesn't care that her skin has grown dark because she's been in the sun. She, he knows that because she's been in the sun working hard, that that's what he finds attractive. Now let me tell you something. Laziness is not attractive. There is no way. Laziness, no way, no shape, no how, is ever found attractive. If your gal or your guy is lazy and refuses to work, don't get into a relationship with them. You're not going to change them. I met with a young man one time, and he was talking to me about the problems that, that he had with his wife. And I said, well, what's the problem? She does nothing. She doesn't work a job. She doesn't do anything at home. All she does is sits around, and he gave me this whole story. And I said, when did that change? He goes, oh, it didn't change. She was like that when I met her. He thought he was going to change her. Laziness has no attraction to it. You get that person that don't pick up after themselves? Don't get into a relationship. That's not going to change if you get married. You find that person who, whose work ethic is, is small? Nothing's going to change there. But you can find it. You say, well, how do I know they're worth that work ethic? <coughs> Look at the little things. You can definitely tell a person's work ethic by, by the little things. If they're the ones who leave their trash in a pew on Sunday morning, that's a sure sign of laziness. If they're the person who leaves their buggy in the middle of the parking lot at the Walmart, that's a pretty sure sign of laziness. If they're the ones who just throw their things down and leave them, that's a sure sign of laziness. Look for those. Because one of the things that we need to be attracted to is, in the opposite sex, is hard work. We need to see that. This one not working on you? Huh? I'm telling you now, okay, bring me a battery. Switch to yours. Sorry, folks in the parking lot, we are experiencing technical difficulties. All right, we're going to try microphone number three with, with point number five. We need to be submissive. The last part of verse 6 told us that, that she let her vineyards go to care for those of her mother and brother because she was submissive. Scripture teaches us. Here is the, it's the guy looking at the gal again. Scripture teaches us the wife is to submit to her husband. That does not mean she is a slave. That does not mean she is inferior. 
That does not mean she becomes the little woman. What submissive does is submissive tells us that she puts her husband ahead of herself. Often in, in weddings, we'll, we'll, I'll meet with the couple and we'll talk about the vows. And, and in that part where the, the gal is to say, to love, honor, and obey. And they'll look at me really strange. I had one woman one time, she was I'm not saying I'll obey him. I said, then I'm not doing the wedding. And he said, then I'm not getting married. <laughs> she finally said obey. But she didn't. They didn't go on. Part of that is submissiveness. Putting the spouse ahead of you. Making their needs, their wants, their desires them more important than you. I love what it says in the book of Proverbs. It says in Proverbs that a contentious woman is like a leaky faucet. Drip. 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 Doesn't that get annoying? You know, the person who is not submissive is just like that. Drip. Drip. Rip. Ladies, you want to be a lover of your man? Put him before you. We need to be submissive. Number six. My number six thing that I find from this passage is relationships should not be secretive. Now listen to me say that again. Relationships should not be secretive. Look what it says in verse seven. It says, please tell me, you whom I love, where do you graze your flock? Where does your flock lie down at noon? Tell me, or I will be considered a prostitute wandering among the flocks of your companions. When the men would, would bring their sheep in and their flocks in, there were always these veiled women hanging around there. And the veiled women would be used as a prostitute. So, so what this lady is saying is she's saying, when I, when I come to you, I'm going to have my veil off. You're going to see me come. And everybody who sees me come is going to know I belong to you and you belong to me. Do you know when we find a lot of problems in relationships? It's when things become veiled. When things become <coughs> dark. So one of those things in our life that, that is important in relationships is relationships should not be secretive. Every week, I meet a roughly 20 new people. And my purpose in meeting them is to tell them how, how I can help care for them, how I can help them through troubles, how I'm there to, to listen to them and, and, and hear, you know, to help them through some struggles. I meet at least 20 people we can do that. But I can tell you, as I tell them how I can care for them, I always make sure to mention something about my wife. Because I want them to know right up front, I'm a married man. And she is mine, and I'm, I'm hers. And I'm going right into that with my veil off. Relationships should not be in secret. Relationships struggle <coughs> when things are bad. Now this morning, I've given you six biblical characteristics of those that we're attracted to. And these are things that, that, that we find here that, that these lovers in, in Psalm of Solomon chapter 1 uh, find attractive in, in the opposite sex. But I want, you, I want you to better understand this opposite sex. And if we're going to understand them, and if we're going to understand that attraction, let me sum up everything I've said in one sentence. And that one sentence is this. You're going to want to write this down. When you see who you are and what you are, then you will know who you are attracted to. The first thing of attraction isn't what we find in someone else. It's looking at who we are. 
It's looking at what we are. Because when we do that, then we'll see who we're attracted to. If we think we're the lowest that species on the planet, we're not going to be attracted to anything much higher. When you see who you are, who you really are, what you really are, then you'll know who you're attracted to. Now, maybe there's some things that already this morning in your life you realize, I need to make some changes. Some of you can't wait till the service is over so you can sign up for the Valentine's Day. Because you need to be sweet. Some, some of you are ready to fix some other things. That's important. Let's do that. But, but to help you to see, are there areas that you need to change in who you are and what you are? Let me ask you four questions. Question number one. This one's just going to go to married couples. It can also go to those who are engaged or have been dating for a long time. But here's the question. If this was day one all over again, would your spouse be attracted to you right now? Or have you let some things go? Those things you used to do, you don't do them anymore. If this was day one all over again, would your spouse be attracted to you right now? Or does something need to change? Question number two. Where are you looking to find beauty? Because if all you're looking at is the exterior, let's face it, try as we might, that exterior still fades. The pretty does go away. The handsome doesn't become as handsome anymore. So are we looking for beauty on the outside? Or are we looking for the beauty within? Maybe something needs to change. Question number three. What needs to change in you to improve the person you are attracted to? Remember what you are and who you are is going to help you to know who you're talking to. So what needs to change in you? Let's face it. If you don't think much of yourself, you're not going to be looking for much either. If you're going to scrape the bottom of the barrel, you're going to get scum. So what needs to change in you to improve the person you're talking to? And question number four, and I'm going to tell you, this is the most important one. Where is God in your life right now? Are you that person who is actively serving God? Are you the Sunday Christian? Or do you only come to church just to be sweet? Where is God in your life right now? You'll be attracted to someone. Because wherever God is in your life, the person you're attracted to, God will be lower in their life most of the time. So if God's not where he needs to be in your life, then you're settling for something less than the person you're attracted to. Where is God in your life right now? And maybe, maybe there needs to be a change there as well. Maybe this morning it's time for you to surrender your life to Christ. Because all this time you've been trying to do it yourself. You, you think that, that your sins will be atoned for by your good works. But you realize that Romans 3 does say all have sinned and fallen short of God's mark of perfection. None of us can save ourselves. So they, maybe that, that change needs to take place to your salvation. Maybe the change needs to take place in your daily walk with God. You know God, but you're keeping Him from quite a distance. And it's time to move a little closer to where He is. Maybe it's time just to confess your sin. Change from that sinful lifestyle you're living and then follow Him. Maybe today 
that change needs to be spiritual, physical, emotional. But what needs to change in your life so that God's where he needs to be? How do we understand the opposite sex? We start by attraction. And attraction stems on who we are or what we are. And this morning, if there's something that needs to change in you, the time to make that change is now. As we sing this next song, use that as your time to pray. Maybe right where you're at, maybe you want to come to this altar. Maybe you just want to, to, to stay seated and then bow your head and say, Lord. But if, it's, if there's a change that needs to be made, that change needs to be made now. Because unless we change, we'll never begin to understand the opposite side. Father, thank you so much for your word. Father, thank you for just the, what your word teaches us about who we're attracted to and why we're attracted to them. Help us, Lord, to change who we are and what we are so that we can be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray.